listen very closely, as closely as you possibly can, to Matthew 24. Don't let anything else you might hear take your mind off this and distract you from this, no matter what. But if something does, text it to yourself. If something does, just if if something does distract you from this video, text it to yourself. Bleh. Listen to Matthew 24. Chapter 24. As Jesus was leaving the temple grounds, his disciples pointed out to him the various temple buildings. But he told them, Do you see all these buildings? I assure you they will be so completely demolished that not one stone will be left on top of another. Later Jesus sat on the slopes of the Mount of Olives. His disciples came to him privately and asked, When will all this take place? And will there be any sign ahead of time to signal your return and the end of the world? Jesus told them, Don't let anyone mislead you, for many will come in my name saying, I am the Messiah. They will lead many astray, and wars will break out near and far, but don't panic. Yes, these things must come, but the end won't follow immediately. The nations and kingdoms will proclaim war against each other, and there will be famines and earthquakes in many parts of the world. But all this will be only the beginning of the horrors to come. Then you will be arrested, persecuted, and killed. You will be hated all over the world because of your allegiance to me. And many will turn away from me and betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and will lead many people astray. Sin will be rampant everywhere, and the love of many will grow cold. But those who endure to the end will be saved, and the good news about the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world so that all nations will hear it. And then, finally, the end will come. The time will come when you will see what Daniel the prophet spoke about, the sacrilegious object that causes desecration standing in the holy place. Reader, pay attention. Then those in Judea must flee to the hills. A person outside the house must not go inside to pack. A person in the field must not return even to get a coat. How terrible it will be for pregnant women and for mothers nursing their babies in those days. And pray that your flight will not be in winter or on the Sabbath, for that will be a time of greater horror than anything the world has ever seen or will ever see again. In fact, unless that time of calamity is shortened, the entire human race will be destroyed, but it will be shortened for the sake of God's chosen ones. Then if anyone tells you, look, here is the Messiah, or there he is, don't pay any attention, for false messiahs and false prophets will rise up and perform great miraculous signs and wonders so as to deceive, if possible, even God's chosen ones. See, I have warned you. So if someone tells you, look, the Messiah is out in the desert, don't bother to go and look. Or look, he is hiding here. Don't believe it. For as the lightning lights up the entire sky, so it will be when the Son of Man comes. Just as the gathering of vultures shows there is a carcass nearby, so these signs indicate that the end is near. Immediately after those horrible days end, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give light, the stars will fall from the sky, and the powers of heaven will be shaken. Then at last, the sign of the coming of the Son of Man will appear in the heavens, and there will be deep mourning among all the nations of the earth, and they will see the Son of Man arrive on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send forth his angels with the sound of a mighty trumpet blast, and they will gather together his chosen ones from the farthest ends of the earth and heaven. Now learn a lesson from the fig tree. When its buds become tender and its leaves begin to sprout, you know without being told that summer is near. Just so, when you see the events I've described beginning to happen, you can know his return is very near, right at the door. I assure you, this generation will not pass from the scene before all these things take place. 
heaven and earth will disappear, but my words will remain forever. However, no one knows the day or the hour when these things will happen, not even the angels in heaven or the Son himself. Only the Father knows. When the Son of Man returns, it will be like it was in Noah's day. In those days before the flood, the people were enjoying banquets and parties and weddings right up to the time Noah entered his boat. People didn't realize what was going to happen until the flood came and swept them all away. That is the way it will be when the Son of Man comes. Two men will be working together in the field. One will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding flour at the mill. One will be taken, the other left. So be prepared, because you don't know what day your Lord is coming. Know this, a homeowner who knew exactly when a burglar was coming would stay alert and not permit the house to be broken into. You also must be ready all the time, for the Son of Man will come when least expected. Who is a faithful, sensible servant to whom the Master can give the responsibility of managing his household and feeding his family? If the master returns and finds that the servant has done a good job, there will be a reward. I assure you the master will put that servant in charge of all he owns. But if the servant is evil and thinks, my master won't be back for a while, and begins oppressing the other servants, partying and getting drunk, well, the master will return unannounced and unexpected. He will tear the servant apart and banish him with the hypocrites. In that place... There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Chapter 25. The kingdom of heaven can be illustrated, but... Now, now, listen to Matthew 6 and 7. But like I said, if you hear anything other than Matthew 6 and 7, ignore it. If, if you get distracted from watching this video pause it and either take a, a screenshot of this video's title or and or if you know how to do both text it to yourself but now listen to matthew 6 and 7 6. Take care, don't do your good deeds publicly to be admired because then you will lose the reward from your Father in heaven. When you give a gift to someone in need, don't shout about it as the hypocrites do, blowing trumpets in the synagogues and streets to call attention to their acts of charity. I assure you, they have received all the reward they will ever get. But when you give to someone, don't tell your left hand what your right hand is doing. Give your gifts in secret, and your Father, who knows all secrets, will reward you. And now about prayer. When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who love to pray publicly on street corners and in the synagogues where everyone can see them. I assure you, that is all the reward they will ever get. But when you pray, go away by yourself, shut the door behind you, and pray to your Father secretly. Then your Father who knows all secrets will reward you. When you pray, don't babble on and on as people of other religions do. They think their prayers are answered only by repeating their words again and again. Don't be like them, because your Father knows exactly what you need even before you ask Him. Pray like this. Our Father in heaven, may your name be honored. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done here on earth just as it is in heaven. Give us our food for today, and forgive us our sins, just as we have forgiven those who have sinned against us. And don't let us yield to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. If you forgive those who sin against you, your Heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, your Father will not forgive your sins. Chapter 7 Stop judging others, and you will not be judged. For others will treat you as you treat them. Whatever measure you use in judging others, it will be used to measure how you are judged. And why worry about a speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own? How can you think of saying, let me help you get rid of that speck in your eye when you can't see past the log in your own eye? 
hypocrite. First get rid of the log from your own eye, then perhaps you will see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. Don't give what is holy to unholy people. Don't give pearls to swine. They will trample the pearls, then turn and attack you. Keep on asking, and you will be given what you ask for. Keep on looking, and you will find. Keep on knocking, and the door will be opened. For everyone who asks receives, everyone who seeks finds, and the door is open to everyone who knocks. You parents, if your children ask for a loaf of bread, do you give them a stone instead? Or if they ask for a fish, do you give them a snake? Of course not. If you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give good gifts to those who ask him? Do for others what you would like them to do for you. This is a summary of all that is taught in the law and the prophets. You can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad, and its gate is wide for the many who choose the easy way. But the gateway to life is small, and the road is narrow, and only a few ever find it. Beware of false prophets who come disguised as harmless sheep, but are really wolves that will tear you apart. You can detect them by the way they act, just as you can identify a tree by its fruit. You don't pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles. A healthy tree produces good fruit, and an unhealthy tree produces bad fruit. A good tree can't produce bad fruit, and a bad tree can't produce good fruit. So every tree that does not produce good fruit is chopped down and thrown into the fire. Yes, the way to identify a tree or a person is by the kind of fruit that is produced. Not all people who sound religious are really godly. They may refer to me as Lord, but they still won't enter the kingdom of heaven. The decisive issue is whether they obey my Father in heaven. On judgment day, many will tell me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and performed many miracles in your name. But I will reply, I never knew you. Go away. The things you did were unauthorized. Anyone who listens to my teaching and obeys me is wise, like a person who builds a house on solid rock. Though the rain comes in torrents and the floodwaters rise and the winds beat against that house, it won't collapse because it is built on rock. But anyone who hears my teaching and ignores it is foolish, like a person who builds a house on sand. When the rains and floods come and the winds beat against that house, it will fall with a mighty crash. After Jesus finished speaking, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, for he taught as one who had real authority. Quite unlike the Listen as closely as you can to to some of the news. So Continue on. What were you saying about the mayor? So I was saying that it was just clear that the way the city tried on Friday was they had first their bicycle units that were out to confront the original protesters. It was a softer approach. And even the chief of police came down. And there was a point where they said, look, if these folks don't clear the street, they were going to be arrested. Well, finally, the chief of police said, no, this is not going to be an arrest fest. In other words, they can stay in the streets as long as they protest peacefully. But it wasn't long after that that you began seeing people jumping on top of police cars and then defacing the police cars. And then you saw one of them get set on fire. And then we saw the damage that was being done to CNN Center. So it escalated in a way that clearly caught this city off guard. That's not to say that they aren't prepared. It's to say that they have not seen violence like this. It's always been described as a city too busy to hate. Something has changed here. And the change is that even in what is the city, the birthplace of Dr. King, known for nonviolence, violence, unfortunately, is here, Doc. I've been wanting to ask this question to, to someone, and I think that if anyone can answer this question, especially among our correspondence ranks, correspondent ranks, it would be you, Martin Savage, considering your experience in, the, in being in war zones and the number of these that you have covered. 
When do we go from protest to riot? Well, you know, there is a legal definition, I'm sure, for that. Um, it's pretty clear that now we've gone from a level of people wanting to express their outrage, their legitimate horror and anger at what was a horrible event carried out by law enforcement, and not just this one that took place in Minneapolis, but in many other places, including Ahmaud Arbery, whose case I've been covering for some time. And it's reached a point where people went from protest to now rioting. Why that is, I'm, I've asked many people. Everyone who I talk to notes there has been a shift here, and they can't explain it. And I'm afraid I can't explain it either to you, Don. But it's clear that violence right now is ruling, and it is destroying not only buildings and livelihoods, but a cause which is just. Because right now people are focused on just looking at the aftermath of violence. Well, uh, you can see some of the heavy uh, National the, Guard equipment. Yeah. Well, listen, Martin, we go, we're going to get to the break. We're going to continue to watch this. But what I do have to say, and if just quickly, if you can just... Um, confirm this for me there are so many this isn't just one group or two group or three groups these are a bunch of different factions a bunch of different people some of it is organized some of it is not so we can't put, uh, put the blame on one particular group and say well this is a group of because there are pr legitimate protesters in this group uh, legitimate rabble rousers there are uh, people who want to cause trouble anarchists so, uh, out outsiders so on and so forth so uh, this this is complicated It is indeed complicated, and at the same time, you have law enforcement that is put under tremendous strain as they try to weed out those who are doing things obviously for the wrong reasons and those who are protesting for obviously the right reasons here. Uh, just today, the uh, mayor announced that, uh, or the chief of police rather, announced that two police officers have been fired as a result of what was deemed to be over-aggressive actions last night in a takedown of several uh, young people that were inside of a vehicle. We happened to be right next to that as that all unfolded last night. And so quickly, even under these conditions, the city is willing to say when they see wrong done by officers, they will immediately react to that wrong. In this case, it ended with the firings of two police officers. Done. All right. Martin Savage, thank you very much. We're going to continue to monitor uh, what's happening in Atlanta as well as uh, cities all over the country. When we come back, I'm going to speak to George Floyd's brother and Ahmaud Arbery's mother as these protests are escalating all over the country. YouTube of yours, I may not be able be able to cover everything I am wanting to make a point of in this video, but keep in mind, this this video might cut off because I have so many other videos pre-recorded on my iPad camera. This this video might cut off in. In the middle of a part of this video that is so, so, so very important. But listen, I encourage you, in case it does, from now on, whenever you watch the news, no matter which, no matter which TV network you use, if it's CBS, CNN, or Fox, Always, always, always read Matthew 24 if you don't know it well enough to remember it. Because Matthew 24, alongside today's modern news, will show you how soon. Will, will show you how, how close we are to the Lord's return no need to th no need to thank me but I promise you while they are on while they are on commercial break I will keep my eye out when to un 
I, I will keep my eye out for when to unmute the TV. But during this time, I urge you, pause the video, share it, and also do whatever you need to do. No need to thank me. I'm here to help you and I as much as I can. Add 12 minutes to the timer. What can I add for you? 12 minutes to the timer. I put 12 minutes to the timer on your shopping list. Alexa, cancel the timer. 15 minute timer canceled. Alexa, set my timer for 30 minutes. For how long? 30 minutes. 30 minutes, starting now. Protests escalating across the country tonight over the death of George Floyd, his death coming just weeks after the death of Ahmaud Arbery. Their family speaking out tonight together. Joining me now in a CNN exclusive, Philonis Floyd, the brother of George Floyd, and his attorney, Benjamin Klump. Also, Crump, also Wanda Cooper, mother of Ahmaud Arbery, and her attorney, Lee Merritt. Um, thank you all for, uh, for appearing on this program. It's very important, and I'm so happy that you all are here, obviously saddened by the deaths of your loved ones. Uh, Philonis, I'm going to start with you. Protests that started in Minneapolis to seek justice for your brother now happening in almost every major city. What do you think about what you're seeing? Uh, people just want justice right now. They're going to continue to march and protest. And as I ask, I ask everybody to do a peaceful, but we want justice. And that's the reason they acting out like that. The thing is, right now, black folks been getting killed a long time now, for a long time, like years. Trayvon and on up, Eric Gordon, I can't breathe. And my brother, I can't breathe. So people just tired right now. African-Americans, they want to stand up for what's right. Mm-hmm. Wanda, you know, these protests are for your son, Ahmad, too, who was killed at the end of February. What are, your, what are your thoughts when you're seeing the anger that is playing out across the country? People are angry. Unfortunately, it has come to this. It's, it, it really breaks my heart that it, it's come to this. I mean, the, the rioting... I truly understand where they're coming from because black lives are being lost and they're being lost for no reason. You understand the anger? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Are you surprised, as I am, that there are people who are surprised that these sorts of things actually happen? in our country, because this, this seems to be an awakening for a lot of people in this country. Very much surprised. But when I said surprised, 
we have to deal with reality. I mean, things like these are happening and they're happening more than they should. Felonis, this is a country I said earlier, this is a country that, that we all built together collectively. This is a country that, that we all live in. This is, this is the outrage of people who have been mistreated, unheard, their voices haven't been heard, they've tried to be peaceful in many ways. They don't know when they try to protest peacefully, people call them out, shout them out. No, I, I know you don't condone, no one condones the violence and the destruction of property, but how are people of color supposed to protest or supposed to react to injustice in this country? They're gonna protest just like everybody else, normal. Everything that's happening right now is not happening because of what they're doing. People are jumping on them. People are killing them. African Americans, they you have women and men, both are dying right now. Like you can watch the video, and it was nine minutes. The guy stayed on my brother's neck, executed him, murdered him. He couldn't breathe. Breathe. A grown man, 46 years for his mom. That's not real. I need justice for that. It's three cops. They're at home right now, sleeping in their beds, relaxing. The others, he's in jail. There's only one. The other three need to be in there. My brother, he's in the morgue. That's not right. I want justice now. He deserved that. He's a gentle giant. You spoke to the president on the phone this week. Talk to me about what he said to you, and, and were you able to share your pain with the president? President Biden, the vice president, I love this conversation. He talked to me for like 10, 15 minutes, and I was trying to talk his ear off because he was talking to me constantly. Great conversation. But Trump, it lasted probably two minutes. He was trying to... But, you know, it's the president. So that's it. We lost your signal as you were talking about your conversation with uh, President Trump. Can you repeat what you said, please? It was very brief. Uh, the conversation was okay with him. I was just respecting him, you know, listening to what he had to say. And I understood what he was saying, but... Uh, it was just a brief conversation. Mrs. Cooper, I understand that you have, you have not spoken to the president about Ahmad's death. Is that a phone call that you'd like to have? At this point, the death of my son occurred back in February. I think that if President Trump was concerned about the death of Ahmad, a phone call should have been already implemented. And at this point, no. No. I want you both, uh, Felonis and Miss Cooper, I want you both to stand by. We have some breaking news. We're going to get back to you. I want to get to my colleague, though, Sarah Seidner, who is in Minneapolis tonight, and she is with the police chief live there on the ground. Sarah, talk to me. We're at 38th in Chicago, right where George Floyd lost his life. The police chief showed up here. Chief, you came here to do what? We, we watched you walk up to this memorial. What did you come here to do today? I, I came to pay my respects uh, to Mr. Floyd. And I, I, I came to just offer prayer for his loved ones, his family, and our community that's hurting. Uh, I grew up about a block from here, and uh, this has been so impactful uh, for, for me, for this department, but for our city. But I also wanted to be in a space where people who love Mr. Floyd, I want to be in a space where people are talking about how do we heal and how do we move from this. And so um, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take time, and I think that everyone here is 
trying to, it's it, and, and everyone here is trying to do the best that they can to to offer what their feelings, and, and that's those are all valid. Um, but I just I just needed to be here in this space today, and um, and and offer my my respects. Let, let me ask you about what happened with Officer Derek Chauvin. First off, he had 18 complaints filed against him. 16 of those complaints uh, were declined. They did not do anything to him. Two of those complaints, he did get censured. Should he have been on the force in the first place? Well, I, I sir, we need to absolutely look at the, the record of those uh, types of complaints that officers or employees get throughout. There's, there's all types of other things that come into play in terms of whether it's uh, grievances and arbitrations and those things. But at the end of the day, our community members need to know that the men and women that put this badge on, that they are doing so in service to them and they should not and they should not have to doubt they should not have to doubt the integrity and and if they're going to be treated in a compassionate and professional way and so those are things that as we move forward uh, we need to we need to get better in terms of this profession absolutely can I ask you why you decided I have not seen this happen this quickly before in past cases I have covered many many protests around the world including what happened in 2014 uh, in the Michael Brown case in for in Missouri. Why did you decide that firing the officers would happen as quickly as it did? Many departments do not fire officers that fast. There are absolute truths in life. We, we need air to breathe. The, the killing of Mr. Floyd was an absolute truth that it was wrong. And so it did not take, I did not need days or weeks or months or processes or bureaucracies to tell me that what occurred out here last Monday, it was wrong. I want to ask you what you thought when you saw the video that we all saw of Mr. Floyd on the ground, his face smashed into the ground, gulping almost like a fish out of water with Chauvin's knee on his neck for more than seven minutes. What did you see? What did that do to you as the chief seeing your officer on top of this man? It was, there was a visceral reaction. I will just say that I was emotional. Um, shortly after I saw that, I put a call out to our local black ministers, activists and leaders. We met that morning, and I will tell you that it was, uh, we, and I asked them to start with prayer, because that's what we needed, and that's what I needed. And so uh, it was an emotional reaction that I, I, I've never experienced in my career. Never experienced in my career. So many times officers are fired, and they get their jobs back with the help of the union. They end up getting paid out by the city. Do you see that happening to these four officers in the case that you fired? That, that's going to be a process down the road. All I can be responsible is for uh, the power that I had, which is an employment matter decision. And so I felt that I made the right decision. Why did you fire them, though? Was this an absolute violation of this guidelines this, and policy? In, in my mind, this was a violation of humanity. This was a violation of the oath that the majority of the men and women that put this uniform on, this goes absolutely against it. This is contrary to what we believe in. And so, uh, again, what occurred to me, it was an absolute truth that it was wrong. Period. The Floyd family is happens to be on live with us uh, talking to Don Lemon. Is there anything that you would like to say to this family who is in utter despair and grief right now? I would say to the Floyd family that uh, I'm absolutely uh, devastatingly sorry for their loss. And if I could do anything to bring Mr. Floyd back, I, I would do. I would move heaven and earth to do that. So I'm very sorry. I'm very sorry. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time, Chief. I appreciate it. Like, you know, people, you, you heard the Chief and you saw the Chief take his hat off. Take his hat off. And say, that he absolutely is sorry for what hey, happened. Sarah, can you do me a favor? To can George you get Floyd. the chief? Is there any way you can get he the chief back? He said that to the family. 
Uh, yes, I can. Don, you can, yes. Because I, yes. I think, I, I think the family like may have. Yes. Yeah, I think the family may have a question or two if for If the family just... wants to ask a question, please, please. Yeah, yeah. Which, I'll turn around. You tell me the absolutely. question, and I will turn absolutely. to him and ask Thank whatever you, you want. I hate to cut you whatever off the there. Floyd family would like me to ask. For, for long, no, absolutely. You have a question for the, for the chief? Can hear you. Polonis, do you have a question for the chief? Oh, I want, I, the question that I have, uh, I want to know if he's going to get me justice for my brother and re arrest all the officers and convict them. Can you hear him, Sarah? Okay, he. I just want to make sure I've got this right. He arrest wants to know if he justice is for his brother. Arrest and convict and arrest all the officers. The other officers. All the officers. I will ask him that question. Just give me one second. Yes, ma'am. Chief, may I ask you? I'm so sorry, and I, I apologize. I'm so sorry. I, I, I know. I'm so sorry, but the Floyd family. The Floyd family actually has a question for you. They just talked to me in my ear. I, I'm sorry. The Floyd. Floyd family is asking me a question. I, I apologize. I'm sorry. The Floyd family has asked if you are going to get justice for George Floyd by making sure that the other officers are arrested and that eventually convicted. They, they want to, and I know that there are things that you cannot control, but they want to know if the other officers should be arrested in your mind and if you see that they should all four be convicted in this case. And this is the Floyd family right now? This is the Floyd family. To, to the Floyd family, um, being silent or not intervening to me, you're complicit. So I don't see a level of distinction any different. Um, so, uh, obviously, it, the charging and those decisions will have to come through our county attorney's office. Certainly, the FBI is investigating that. But to the Floyd family, I want you to know that my decision to fire all four officers was not based on some sort of hierarchy. Mr. Floyd died in our hands, and so I, I, I see that as being complicit. So that, that is about as much as I, and I apologize to the Floyd family if I uh, am not more clear, but um, uh, I don't see a difference in, in terms of uh, the ultimate outcome is he is not here with us. You and that's don't see tragedy. a difference between what Officer Chauvin did and the three other officers who, some of who kneeled down as well, but some of whom just watched, you see that all as the same act. Silence and inaction, you're complicit. You're complicit. If there were one solitary voice that would have intervened and act, that that's what I would have hoped for. Uh, unfortunately, that's what you would have expected from your officers, yes? Absolutely, and that did not occur. So to the Floyd family, I, I hope that that's my that's my response. Yeah. And, right. Thank Falonis, you so much. Do you have Chief, another question? Yes. What's, what's your response? What's your response to Falonis? Uh, they arrest guys every day. They had enough evidence to fire them, so they have enough evidence to arrest them. I don't know who he's talking to, but I need him to do it because we all are listening. Black Lives Matter. Sarah, um, that was a, an incredible interview that you did, and it was the first time, uh, you know, I don't, have you, hang on, Sarah, you, you haven't spoken to anyone at the police department, I'm not sure, Falonis, correct me if I'm wrong, have you spoken to them directly? So that was really the first interaction that you've had with the police department since your brother's death. So Sarah, in the course of this uh, this broadcast, we have been able to connect the family with the police department through your interview. Um, right, for the first time. I, I can't yeah. tell you, Don, what that's doing to me to hear them have this conversation through me to the, to the chief, sorry. Um, to hear the pain in the Floyd family's voice and to have to convey that, I hope that I did the right thing for them because I know that they are hurting so, so badly. But I do want to recognize that when the police chief, every time I said that the Floyd family has a question for you, 
to cop his hat. He took his hat off. Yeah. So he wanted to make sure to be respectful. And I know that, that they are angry. I know you are angry. And I know you are hurting. And I know it's not enough. You cannot bring George Floyd back. But you heard what he said. That each and every officer who did not speak up against what was happening is complicit. This is the police chief saying that. This is the police chief. Don, have you ever heard that before in your life? I have not. In all of the 12 years, I have covered so many protests across the world, and I have never seen a police chief say this. But I know it doesn't cure the ills that the Floyd family is dealing with and that all the people in this neighborhood are dealing with right now. So I hope, I hope and pray that I was able to convey what they wanted to the chief in this first time, being able to hear from the chief directly their questions, their concerns. Sarah, I think you're right. I think that Chief Arredondo deserves a lot of credit for doing that. And as we know, it's not the chief's role to convict them, but he did speak out about what he thinks. If you, he said that silence is complicit. Um, Philanese, I know it's uh, it's you're very emotional right now. What did you think of the of the chief's candor? And again, as Sarah pointed out, every time he, he was very respectful, every time he talked, addressed you and your family, he took off his hat. And he spoke very candidly about at least what he could share about how he felt this case was going. Hello, Don, just for a second. Ben, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk to you, Ben. What did you think of what the chief said? Well, uh, he was very respectful to the family, and we thank him for that. This family is in great pain, Don. Yesterday was the anniversary of George's mother's death two years ago, and so they're now having to grieve publicly as they get ready for a few. Um, he thanked the chief for talking about they need these officers to be arrested as we, you know, go through all of this just to get equal justice, simple justice. That's all they want is what would happen if the roads were reversed to happen here. And that's what he continues to express about black Americans keep getting killed by police and nobody held accountable. It's a, a expression of righteous anger that people are expressing all across America. But even as much pain as Filonis is going through, he's still asking people to be peaceful because we don't want innocent people to be affected and we don't want people to misconstrue what the mission is. It's for justice for Filonis, justice for Maude Aubrey, justice for Breonna Taylor, and so many other. Well, Filonis and, and Benjamin Crump, we're having trouble with uh, your signal, and we can see it's it's very emotional. And uh, Sarah, uh, stand by. Don't go anywhere, Sarah. I haven't forgotten that you're there. I want to get to Lee Merritt, though, and Ms. back to Mrs. Cooper. Um, Lee, you know, they've had a chance to speak with really the, the people, so to speak, who are... Heavenly Father, I repent and confess of all of my sins. I forgive everyone who has sinned against me, Lord. I ask you to help this news story and this video help people realize that if they do not ask if they do not ask Jesus to be their Lord and Savior and to come in, and to come in, into their heart, help people who who are not saved to realize after watching this video that unless they ask you Jesus to come into their heart, they will still have to suffer things like this because. If they will, if they will read 
the book of the, I mean, the book of Re Revelation. <clears throat> if they will read the book of Revelation, they will see that if they do not ask Jesus into their heart, after we Christians leave this earth, they will have to suffer through much, much worse than anything that has ever happened on this earth or in the United States before. I ask you to help everyone lost on this earth to realize that we Christians are getting ready to leave this earth and they need to ask Jesus and it help them to realize that we Christians are leaving this earth soon and that they need to ask Jesus into their heart and if they do not ask and if they do not ask him into their heart they will suffer through much much worse than anything that has happened on this earth before I ask this in Jesus' name, amen.